I'd like to welcome to the stage Jack Conte. Hi, everybody. Um, so I am Jack Conte. I'm half of the band Pomplamoose. Um, and I'm going to sort of talk about three things today. I'm going to briefly talk about Pomplamoose. I'm going to try to give you guys uh, the, the story that we don't usually give people, because I feel like that's, uh, that's right for, for this space. <laughs> And then um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this robot music video that I started making six months ago, eight months ago, and how that kind of led into this other project. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about money, because that's important. <laughs> and um, this is my first year at XOXO, so I uh, apologize in advance. I've learned there are some XOXO no-nos, and I will be saying some of those words. I will be saying the C word. Um, <laughs> I, I will also be using the word uh, monetization during my talk, apologies for that. Um, but these are things that I think about as an independent musician, and in all seriousness, uh, you know, I don't feel like content creator is a, a derogatory term. I know it's putting people in a bucket, but it, it describes, at least sufficiently, a, a new generation, this, the emergence of this creative class of small business people who don't have to be Lady Gaga to make a living. And so that's what I think of when I think of content creator. Um, OK, so I want to start with Pomplamoose. I'm getting a feel for how this works here. So that's current slide, next slide. OK, great. So OK, uh, so this is of my childhood bedroom. This is where Pomplamoose started. This is a bunch of stuff that we got on Craigslist for like 50 bucks. That's a piano from the 1890s. It's an Adam Schaaf piano. It was $50 on Craigslist. And um, yeah, all this stuff is really cheap gears, low barrier to entry these days. This is like 2008, I believe. And so um, we uploaded this video, a cover of Beyonce's Single Ladies. It was our first like big pop cover that we did. And back in 2008, that was kind of a new thing. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Pop Moose, I'm going to just play a quick clip of Single Ladies so you can see what it looks like. All the single ladies, 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 all the single ladies. Watch your hands up, 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 up. In the club, just broke up, doing my own little thing. Sorry that you dip, and now you want to trip, cause I'm not gonna notice me. Okay, so that's, that's, what it, that's what we uploaded. It's basically a performance video of us in our bedroom making our music, and that was a cool thing in 2008. So um, in, now fast forward a few years, it's not everybody's seen this before. The bedroom musician is like a common thing. Um, but when we uploaded this, about a day later, do you guys remember when Kanye uh, made an ass of himself at the VMAs like four <laughs> years ago? And he, he gets in the middle of just poor little beautiful Taylor Swift's uh, acceptance speech for best music video. She's this cute little girl, 17 or something. She's on stage saying thank you. Kanye comes up, takes the microphone out of, his, out of her hand. It's like, yo, Taylor, that's cool. But Beyonce had one of the best music videos of all time. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, and, and everybody starts booing. And the next day, everybody goes online and searches for Beyonce single ladies. <laughs> And we got about 500,000 hits in one night. And that was in 2008. That was like when 500,000 hits was a lot of hits. And so, so uh, over the years, that racked up views. And, and we started uploading more videos and more covers and originals. We started selling songs. And we started playing shows for big crowds of people. And brands started asking us. We flew to Austria and did this A1 commercial. And then Hyundai turned our garage into a sound stage. And we did these cool uh, car commercial music videos. They let us do video songs on television, which was really exciting. We, part of the contract was they weren't allowed to be in the room. They had to leave the room when we were filming. So we're making this big car commercial with nobody in the room but me and Natalie. <laughs> OK, and then we played bigger shows. We're releasing more songs, and we play the Warfield. And, and, uh, and this is a New Year's Eve show. It was really fun with the Dresden Dolls. People start uploading fan art. We really feel like there's this community of people sort of coming together around pop moves. It's really exciting. Really, like, people are spending time and creating these beautiful portraits of us. And some of them aren't quite as flattering. But, <laughs> but, it's, but they're still putting in lots of time, and it's really exciting. And, 
and so then one month we release a, we release our, just this compilation of songs on iTunes. We release, a, 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 we call it, it's just our covers, we call it Tribute to Famous People, we throw it on iTunes. And that month we sold 30,000 songs. And I check my bank account and, and I'm living in my dad, my old bedroom, right? And, and I have $22,000 in my bank account. And uh, we bought a, a house and there was a dog kennel on the property and we gutted it and converted it into a recording studio and rebuilt the space. We built another recording studio in the main house and, and I put up this cool wood on the walls and we had some money and we started making things. And then, and then, so this is the version now, that's the version that everybody hears. <laughs> uh, here's what we don't usually talk about. Then, uh, we started getting calls from labels. We said no to labels, but we didn't say no to managers and to going to LA and shopping around and trying to take the band to the next level. Okay, so we're a YouTube band, but we want to be a real band. You know, we want to do, we want to be it for real. We want to be cool. You know, and um, we met this guy in LA, and he said, "You want to know the secret to the music business?" And we said, "Yes." <laughs> <laughs> And he said, hit songs. <laughs> and and I, I don't, I still, I can't figure out what it was. I think it was the, I, maybe it was the way he, had, he said hit songs. <laughs> it was, it, we, Natalie and I said, yes, hit, that's what the secret is. And so we, we entered this mode of, okay, we have to like, not write like, you know, Katy Perry or whatever. I actually like Katy Perry. Not, I don't mean that in a bad way, but not, we don't have to write other people's music. We just have to take our own voice and like optimize and make it really great. Then, you know, our next thing, so we've done this thing on YouTube, now the next thing we make has to be like amazing. You know, we gotta put it out, it's gotta be great. And that's this mode that we got into and then we didn't write anything that we felt like was that great that month. So we didn't put anything out. And then we kept trying and we sort of got a little fearful and, we, and, we did it, and then it turned into two months and I think you see where this is going. Six months and then nothing and then a year and nothing. And then we're just scared and now it has to be really great because we haven't uploaded anything in a long time and if we coming back onto the scene, it better be really freaking good. And we are scared to even sit down at the piano and write something. And I'm actually really embarrassed about that. I'm embarrassed for getting um, sucked into this artificial paradigm um, when in fact we should have just kept doing what we were doing. Um, so that turned into three years and, and we felt stifled and frustrated and YouTube changed and our hits went down and iTunes sales went down and that's a very tough thing to watch as as a creative person, to, to feel like you've hit this spike and then it's just the rest of your life you see before you and it's lonely and desperate and sad. And, and, and so we decided to put the band on hiatus. It was like too sad to even think about. Um, and so, so Natalie raised a bunch of money on Kickstarter, made her solo record. I went off in my own direction. I had been uploading videos anyway on the side with my own channel. I started decided, okay, I'm gonna learn electronic music. I'm gonna make an, a, a music video, a crazy robotic music video, because I just desperately wanted to be back in my old childhood room, just making something for the joy of making it and not worrying about hit songs and not worrying about, I just wanted to make something for fun. So I started building this robot music video. This is this table, I had this idea, I was gonna have these two tables and there was gonna be a rotating elevator that was gonna come out of these platforms and then robots were gonna come out of the elevators and I was gonna be in the middle playing guitar and playing with the robots. <laughs> and I just really wanted to do this because it was like, it had, I knew it wasn't gonna get a lot of hits because that's just, that's not the kind of video that's gonna get hits, I'll talk about that in a second. So I start making this elevator. And I'm in my bedroom now, I'm sorry, not my bedroom, I'm in the studio that we built. I'm, I start constructing this thing, I buy this bearing on Amazon, it raises out of the table. I'm trying to figure out how to make that happen, it gets more and more complicated. I start spending like long, long days in the studio. Um, so I'm, I'm, I get this pulley system and that doesn't work, I've got a winch up there and this thing is good and it's just not, it's, 
it was really hard. Eventually, I got it to work, and then I decide, <laughs> I really want this to be cool, so I'm going to build a Millennium Falcon replica set behind all of this. And as I'm playing guitar, there's robots, and I'm in the Millennium Falcon, and I'm rocking out to electronic music. So I start going, and I only have like two months left, so I really better get cranking if I'm going to do this in my studio. So I start framing a wall, but I don't know how to frame a wall. So I go to Home Depot, and I ask them, and the guy tells me you have to cut at an angle, and I say, how do you cut at an angle? And he says, this is this thing called a miter saw, which I don't know what a miter saw is, but I, I bought one, and I cut it at an angle, and I bolted it to the ceiling, and it worked. And then uh, I start spending longer, longer days. Now I'm spending like 15, 16, 17 hour days in the studio, and, and I'm, I'm building this stuff and trying to learn a lot, and I'm building these panels, right, because I'm gonna post those. So I'm like, I'm spending my days like cutting holes in pieces of cardboard and gluing vellum to the bottom and like putting thumbtacks in these things, and it, and it gets more and more, I build more and more panels. <laughs> And I start putting them up on the walls, and there's no one, my girlfriend's out on tour now, there's nobody to regulate my life and like make me. <laughs> so I'm going to bed at like 5 a.m. and I'm not eating, and like I keep, I keep making this thing. I'm hoarding garbage, and I've got like styrofoam. I've got styrofoam in the walls, and, and, and I'm, I'm like going to junkyards and getting vents and like old poles and things to glue onto the set. And eventually, um, my, my hands are all beat up and gross and everything from, you know, I'm really like driving, you know? But I'm loving it because I feel like I'm making something. And, and then it, it, the set comes together. It comes together. It took 50 days, about 18 hours a day. And, and, and this is now, we haven't done the robots yet. The robots are still coming. So, so okay. Anyway, the point of this is that it finally happened. And I made it, and the robots came, and I had been communicating with this guy in England. I had been reading these books about like being an entrepreneur and stuff, and I was like reading that like all these entrepreneurs like max out their credit cards and go broke, and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna like, <laughs> and, and it was dumb, but I, I decided I was gonna do it just, just because I thought maybe, well, if I max out my credit card, I'll make it, you know? So, so I did, and I just kept, it was like this rabbit hole. And uh, this is the video. Okay, so that's just a short clip of the video. So, okay, but here's here's what I here's what I realized, which is that this is half of my job now. I'm an independent musician. I've I've made something, and that's half of it. The other half is this. <laughs> I have to take something that I made and put it in an equation and out comes money. And I can't forget about that. And we can't forget about that. That's the other half of our job. And if we just want to make good stuff once, then you don't have to worry about this. But if you want to keep doing it, you have to make good stuff and convert it into money. And in 2009, that function was YouTube. YouTube of music equaled money. <laughs> And, and that was great. We pop loose, we put up music, and lo and behold, we get emails with people offering us money and iTunes sales and things, and it works out. But in 2013, YouTube of music does not equal money. And this, uh, so, okay. There's this wonderful creator named Smooth McGroove. He does acapella covers of video game music. I love this kid. He's amazing, he's creative, he's wonderful. I'm going to show you a quick clip of what I'm talking about here. Okay, so if that doesn't make you feel a little nostalgic, then you don't like ice cream. <laughs> it, it, there's, it's undeniable. 
and, and there are tens of thousands of people like him making things, and they have to worry about the other half of the equation too. And uh, ad revenue, sometimes people think it's ad revenue, but ad revenue doesn't really work that well. And here's why. He has 400,000 subscribers. Now, that doesn't really sound or feel like a lot now, because we're, he gets you know, between 400,000 hits and 3 million hits per video, and the internet is populated with things with millions of hits. And it just, we're used to that, and it doesn't feel like a lot, but, I, but this, this is, is 100,000 people. This is 100,000 people. He has four of these looking forward to his next video. And his ad revenue, I actually haven't seen the numbers, but I can just do the math really quickly. Uh, you know, 400,000 hits, a $2 CPM. CPM, I'm sure most of you know, but it's cost per meal. It's how much uh, advertisers <laughs> pay for, no, I'm serious, cost per meal, meal meaning thousand, cost per thousand views. Um, and th that's what a CPM is, and that's how advertisers pay for content. So. Um, Cost per thousand, maybe two dollars per thousand. So then you'd think maybe he's making like, if it gets split with YouTube, maybe he's making like four hundred dollars per, but he doesn't really make four hundred dollars because it also gets split with the publisher for the video game, so it's maybe like a hundred dollars. But then YouTube doesn't monetize all of the views, right? They only monetize a quarter depending on ad inventory in the season, whether we're near Christmas or at the beginning of the year, whatever it is. So maybe it's more like fifty dollars, but then there's usually an arbitrary person in a suit who takes a cut before it goes back to the artist, so maybe it's more like twenty-five dollars. And at the end of the day, he's making making maybe 25 bucks for 400,000 hits. Okay, so first of all, it's not a hit, it's a person, and it's 400,000 people, and, and the reason that it ends up not working is because advertisers don't care how much you like the content that you're about to watch. And that really matters to a creator. If you really like me, and you like what I have to say, and you like my videos, and you bought the t-shirt, and you have the albums, I am so thankful for your existence. I love you. I can't believe how lucky I am that you want to watch my stuff, and I just have this urgent need to express my undying gratitude toward you for, for watching what I'm making. You're the reason that I'm making stuff. And to an advertiser, you're one one thousandth of a CPM and your attention is worth half of a penny. And, and then YouTube splits the half of a penny with me and I'm left with $0.002 for your watching my video. And that's why digital content monetization strategies of 2013, that is pre-roll ads, click-through ads, that sucks. It works at scale if you have a lot of creators and you are a massive company it works, but if you're one creator and you're getting 400,000 hits per video, it doesn't work. There's another thing at play here, which is that the, the view as a currency has been devalued since 2008. It used to be that a view was worth a lot. You may, okay, rewind to, to 2008. Someone sends you a cat video and it has 100,000 hits. Damn, you're gonna watch that cat video because it's gonna be amazing. 100,000 hits on a cat video, that's gonna be funny and cute and you're gonna send it to your aunt and she's gonna love you for sending her the video and it's gonna be awesome. But in 2013, you go onto YouTube and the entire sidebar is cat videos with 100,000 hits. And you're like, okay, skip, 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 not gonna watch that, not even worth like checking out the thumbnail. But then you see one with 20 million hits. I'm gonna watch that cat video. If there's a cat video in 2013 with 20 million hits, it's gonna be really good and I'm gonna send it to my aunt and she's gonna enjoy it just as much as she enjoyed the cat video in 2008 with 100,000 hits. And so in that sense, the value of the view has, been, has gone down since 2008. And I actually think my propensity to watch cat videos is a good measure of the inflation of the view <laughs> over this periods of time. So, uh, Okay, so back to me being broke and being in credit card debt and having to upload my video and what am I gonna do about that? So I'm thinking about all these things with advertisers not valuing content, but it's not that my robot video doesn't have value, I think it does. I just think the equation is broken. It's not being properly valued by advertising. So 
I, I think, what if I just asked my fans? What if I just had a, my, on jackconzie.com, I just say, can I have your credit card? <laughs> I'll, I'll make music videos, maybe give me five bucks every time I release a video. Like, I, I, Natalie raised a bunch of money on Kickstarter. I love the idea of crowdfunding. What if I just said that to my fans and just had them enter their credit card info and could charge their cards whenever they released, whenever I released a music video? And then I started thinking about web comics and all these people putting out stuff for free and not making money. And I realized that maybe this is something for other people too, not just me. And I called up my freshman roommate, Sam Yam. His name is Sam Yam. <laughs> and I said, I told him the idea, and he started coding it that night. And somebody's not happy with this. Okay. <laughs> but he did. He started coding it that night, and two months later, we had Patreon.com, and I posted my robot video, and I, at the end of the robot video, I told my fans how hard I worked, and I asked them to enter their credit cards into this site that we built and maybe give me money every time I come out with a music video if you want me to come out with more. And so this is my Patreon page today. So my fans are collectively giving me $6,454 every time I release a music video now. Um, this is like a, <laughs> thanks. This is, this is a video that's free to watch. This isn't a paywall. I'm not saying pay to watch my music. This is a video on YouTube. Free content for everybody. Pay me if you want to pay me for creating more. It's paying for people to make things. Um, and it's not just working for me. Now we're five months into Patreon. It's working for Smooth. He has, he has $1,500 per video. He's making one video a week. So this is serious income for him. Um, we have somebody coming out with a magazine. We have uh, Lauren O'Connell coming out with songs. She quit her job at the gym. <laughs> um, a, a comic coming out with a, 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 a web comic and a graphic novel, getting paid per page of the graphic novel. For anybody releasing digital content, Peter Hollins is a classically trained vocalist making wonderful uh, vocal videos on YouTube. Um, and so now we've got this thing, Patreon, and we got some funding, and in the process of getting funding and all that, we were able to maintain control of the company, and we didn't give up a board seat, so it's just me and Sam making decisions. And I feel a little bit like I'm back in my bedroom in 2008, and there's some momentum, and the, and the trick at this point is to uh, avoid the temptation to make this into a hit song. And um, because, it starts to feel like the beginning of something, and I, I don't want to get scared now. So, and, and that's actually one thing that I've really enjoyed about being at XOXO is just the, the stark, clear culture and values here, and hearing Andy talk the first day about every food truck that's here for a reason, and every coffee place, and all of you guys, and, um, and the fact that there's no panels, and there seem to be so many values guiding decisions, and that's so important, I think. And it's important with, for me with Patreon. I'm trying to juggle, you know, running Patreon and being a musician, being a content creator, and uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge for me right now, but it, it is exciting, and uh, I, I feel like this now is sort of my model right now. It's, it's working for me right now. I don't know if it's gonna work in the future, um, but, I'm, I'm particularly excited about this, um, and, I, and, and uh, we, we have a lot of work ahead of us to do to, to make sure that this is sustainable and, and that this can be maintained. Um, but for now, I'm pretty excited, and, and I want to just thank Andy and thank you guys for, for listening to me and for having me here, so thank you. <laughs>